So I'm, uh, I'm Casper, I'm here to talk about Flutter, uh, but before I really dive into what Flutter is, I just wanted to tell you a bit about myself. That's not it. I work for, uh, I, I work for Google, I've worked there for um, a bit more than 11 years, and when I joined the company, um, this notion of us building a new browser uh, was born not by me, um, but that's my first project at Google working on, uh, on, the, on the Chrome browser, and specifically the, um, the V8 project, um, which is a, a project I started many years ago. Um, since then, I've uh, ventured on, and today I'm not going to spend too much time talking about V8, uh, but if people are interested in that whole uh, story, uh, I'd be happy to uh, talk about that a bit later as well. Today I'm here to talk about the, um, possibly the best way to build for mobile. And uh, before I do that, I just want to give you a sense for why I think it's really important for us to improve the way we build for mobile. So, this might be a really odd slide here in, in Denmark. Does anyone know who these two persons are? Okay, good. Um, usually people know Barack Obama, at least. Uh, Dick Cheney is also a familiar face. What do you think they have in common? Blank stairs. That's okay. Does this help? This is a hint. They do have something in common. It's not very widely known here in Denmark, I guess. But what they have in common is that they both like this new upcoming show in the US called Hamilton. It's a big deal there. It's not very well known here in Denmark. But apparently, that is the thing that both Dick Cheney and uh, Barack Obama liked uh, and agree on. It's a, it's a sort of a phenomenon in, uh, in the US. It's a big thing. Uh, and uh, It'll probably come to Europe at some point, uh, but uh, having, uh, having witnessed how, how big um, that show is in the U.S., I just needed to tell you about this, this show before we go in. So if you, if you have that, like a really popular show, um, what's, what's left? Like, what do you need? What's missing? And the obvious answer to almost all questions like that is a mobile app. Uh, this show needed a mobile app to go from being super popular to even more popular. Um, and the team uh, and the... Uh, and the producer of this, uh, this show felt like that app had to be sort of a good embodiment of the, of the, of the atmosphere around the show. And they also uh, had this notion that they, not, they needed not yesterday, but close enough, they want it now, right? So you have this problem, you want to build a new mobile app, and you need to build it really, really quickly. Um, it has to be just right, no compromises, the right quality, the right uh, identity. It, looks, it has to look like uh, the right kind of app, uh, but you have to build it really quickly. How do you do that? Um, to be successful with this, you need a, a really productive framework. You need a developer environment that makes your developers really productive. You need a, a platform that supports what I like to call custom UIs really well, because sort of the brand identity uh, for, a, for something like an app for a show of this kind has to be preserved in that app. It shouldn't look like an ordinary app based, like, built by anyone. It needs to look like sort of an, the extension of the show. So this custom UI bit is really, really important. And of course, you need to have a platform that supports doing this and uh, ending up with um, like really beautiful, fast uh, applications. So of course, I'm here to tell you that there is a framework like this uh, that you could be using. Um, and that thing is called Flutter. Flutter is a, is a new project. It has a logo, so it's not entirely new. Um, it's a, something we've been developing on for a, for a number of years now. It's, it's out there in open source, and you can look at it if you want to. Um, it actually started as a bit of an experiment. We wanted to see um, if it was possible for us to build a, a mobile app stack based on some of the core ideas in, uh, in browsers and the team behind it. Uh, actually uh, sort of comes to a great extent from the, uh, from the work done in the Chrome team. And we tried to really uh, like shrink the amount of uh, features uh, necessary to, um, in this platform, take the, the web, uh, ma massage it a bit, and make it much better for, uh, for mobile apps. And there are lots of ways to develop mobile as, uh, apps out there today. And we wanted to, to try to come up with uh, something that we feel like is actually a really compelling story for for the kind of apps that we see people building today. And if you, if you sort of walk through the different kinds of uh, software development kits that are out there, this is a gross oversimplification, of course, like any slide like this should be. Um, but if you look at it from a, like, far enough, you have 
You basically have a set of uh, SDKs that uh, offer sort of a classical model view control uh, setup, and there's a lot of uh, like really neat um, um, SDKs in that space. Uh, everything from the sort of the classical iOS SDKs based on Xcode and Android Studio for Android uh, towards something that's more dynamic, easier to uh, to, um, uh, to to work with for a lot of people uh, like uh, Cordova, PhoneGap, and, and frameworks like that, and also over to um, more reactive frameworks, like uh, there was a presentation yesterday about React Native, which fits really well in here. React Native uh, is, still, again, sort of an interpreted setup with, um, with JavaScript to tie together all the native components, but it's done with a very different framework at the bottom. Uh, the, the way you construct your views is not the classical model view control setup. It's, a, it's more of a reactive style framework where you map um, the application state to the representation um, that you want it to, uh, to appear in, and then you have the framework taking, uh, taking care of computing the, the difference between the previous state and the current state. There is one thing missing here, and uh, of course Flutter fits in here. Um, Flutter is a sort of a functional reactive framework. Um, it, it is compiled to native code, uh, so the applications you ship in, in app stores is mostly ARM uh, uh, machine code. And I'm going to give you more insights into like, what makes Flutter attractive in this space and what does it mean for Flutter to be a, a reactive framework. So Flutter is a very layered architecture. So it, um, it's built on, on a foundation, which is a, sort of a small core, uh, C++ code. And in, the, that, in that core of it, uh, it's very established technologies. Uh, Skia is a, a 2D graphics library, uh, hardware accelerated, that we've been using for Android and Chrome for a long time. Um, some of the text layout is super complicated, uh, and browsers do that well. So we had a, a browser lying around that we could, uh, we could uh, steal that code from. Um, and then we have Dart, uh, the, uh, the language uh, runtime uh, that, that powers the, the rest of the stack. So everything in green is, is written in Dart code, um, but it's still layered, so you can uh, approach the different parts of it and, and hook in where it makes sense for you. In some ways, you could think of the, the green stuff as the user code of the system. You can see all of it, you can, you can change it, you can work with it, um, and it gives a lot of flexibility for, for every user of this framework to be able to peek inside, change and manipulate uh, what they need to. There are a couple of really important things here. Um, I think if you look at the top line, as a, as a developer, you need to have a set of predefined, high-quality uh, widgets available for you to, uh, to be productive and build apps really quickly. So the top line with the material design components is probably one of the, the key points uh, that, that users will see as they come onto a, a Flutter-based stack. Material design is a, is a, is a very big uh, um, uh, sort of design language, uh, and this is just a set of the, the widgets that, uh, that uh, comes built into Flutter and that you can use from the, from the get-go. Um, the point is really that you get this sort of out of the box, and there's a lot of widgets in here. And widgets are not just sort of classical controls in the, sort of the, the sense that people usually refer to them. In Flutter, all widgets are composed of other widgets, and uh, the widgets also control the layout. So there are sort of layout-centric um, widgets like centering or uh, uh, stacking or having columns that are sort of in here as well. I'll show you how this actually looks like in code in a bit, uh, but the, the, um, the, the, the core of it is that you have a sort of highly composable uh, set of widgets that you can use to build um, any kind of UI you'd like. So before we actually just keep talking about these things. I wanted to just show you how it actually looks like on an on a emulated device. That's the easiest I can do. Of course, it runs fine on, uh, on real device as well. Uh, but let me uh, see if I can just run this on the emulator. So what you'll see here is now uh, Flutter starting up. It's using the Android SDK underneath to, uh, to compile and build this, this uh, debug version of the app, upload it to the emulator and start running it. So here we have a, um, an emulated oops, sorry, Flutter app um, that is uh, packed with all the uh, widgets that we could find. Uh, so you can just uh, see a gallery of everything here. It, it has uh, sort of the common cards from Material Design. It has sort of everything you need to, to build this um, and, and build from. 
in itself, it's not super exciting, and it's not intended to be super exciting, but it's really easy to get this up and running. You run the program just like this, and, uh, and you have a, an emulated version of this uh, really quickly running. If you look into the, the core of it, right, you can actually find um, all sorts of uh, interesting uh, material design uh, widgets in here, um, and all of this is, is, is easy to, uh, to, to get inspired from or even use in your app. Let's go back to the presentation. So running Flutter, uh, comes, uh, Flutter comes with a command line interface that makes it really easy to, uh, to manipulate these things. Uh, later, we'll see how it integrates in, the, in an IDE as well, because most people don't like just having a command line interface. It's, it's very clear that people like the quality and the, uh, and the f uh, of these material design widgets that we've included, and uh, people note that if they, as they start building apps on Flutter, um, the fact that they have this set of widgets built in, uh, uh, available from the, from the ground up, is, is really useful for them. It is, however, not really the full story, right? So today, and uh, most people actually don't ship apps just with material design or anything. Like Mobile Pay in Denmark is an example of an app that doesn't look like a, sort of a classical native app. We see people designing UIs that look more like this. This is not a, a, a native Android widget or a, a, an iOS widget. There's something custom built for this kind of app to get a specific look and feel. There are even things that are perhaps even more sort of specialized. Um, and we see Lots of, uh, of this, um, uh, a lot, lot of the uh, very popular apps out there are sort of starting to venture into the area of more custom UI. And custom UI is, is interesting. Um, it means that some people uh, that design apps really want the same look and feel across Android and iOS. It also means that the, the amount of work that goes into an app um, is, is very much determined by how, uh, how sort of fancy the interactions uh, that, uh, that involve these custom UI elements need to be. And it's very common that you have designers that come up with a design like this, uh, and then there's a hard negotiation about like, the cost of implementing these things, because it is, it is hard. Um, so traditionally, I would say that doing custom is hard. We've talked to lots of people that, that find that this is the tricky part in, in, these, in managing the native, um, native apps. But even more so, doing custom twice for the two platforms is really, really painful. Um, and it's hard to keep these things in sync and have, a, have the same experience across these things. So Flutter's solution to this is actually kind of simple. Uh, Flutter solves this by being uh, very layered, and essentially everything uh, that we have as a built-in set of uh, widgets for material design um, is ba based on the same framework and the same layer. So you can build them the same way yourself, and you have access to all these underlying layers, and you can use them. So in some sense, because we've had to support building these material design widgets, we've had to build a very good support into the platform for building custom UI. So in some sense, in Flutter, everything is custom UI. I just want to show you very, very briefly here how, how this looks like in, uh, in the device. Uh, if I go back here, I actually have the, um, let's see. We have actually went ahead and, and built one of these things in here. Uh, and it's, it's, it takes a few days of work to build these things, but it, the platform really supports it well. So I think um, this is a really useful um, way of showing you exactly how the code in this, in this case looks like. And let's take just a bit of it, because otherwise it might be too much. And the point is not for you to look through all this code. Uh, it's to, to show you that everything here is actually based on importing subparts of the, of the Flutter package, uh, and the foundation, the material, and rendering, and reusing those things to build custom UI from them. Um, there's still a lot of magic constants uh, and, and things like that. So it's not, it's not an easy task in that sense, but you have access to everything you need to do this. So building custom UI on Flutter is, um, is, a, is a very doable thing. But I think one of the really key differentiators here is that you don't have to do it twice. So you can actually say, I want to use this thing, and I want to run it across all the devices, not just the, uh, the Android phone here. And now let me see if I can find the, uh, the iPhone. I don't know why that needs to be so much bigger. It bothers me a little bit that the, uh, the, the iPhone is so huge here. But what you see in the background now is actually us uh, building and compiling for both platforms. The Android one was apparently the one we started with. 
and now we're actually running Xcode in the background um, and asking that to do the, the heavy lifting also, getting the, the right application signing, and now you see the app here, uh, and you have the same custom UI written once, uh, but for both, both um, Android and iOS. And it comes with a, um, a bit of customization for the platforms too. So if you look at uh, sort of simple things like the, um, the cards here, you'll find that on, um, on iOS, the overf overflow or the overscroll, um, the way people expect it to behave is, is with sort of a bounce back effect. But if you do the same thing on, on Android, people would be very surprised. We find the same thing here. So on Android, it's supposed to actually look like this with this, this sort of visible marker uh, that comes up in the bottom. So even though it's the same app, there is customization at the, at the platform level that gives it the right look and feel. The way that, uh, the scrolling has to feel is also different than two platforms, and you can, you can really feel it if we, if we get it wrong. Um, so we try not to. OK, so you've seen now that you can build, um, you can build an app here. Simulator. Let's get rid of this one as well. With one code base, and you can have material design uh, widgets. You can have what we call the Cupertino widgets. Apple's headquarters is in Cupertino, uh, so these are the Apple uh, iOS look and feel uh, widgets. And you have access to all of these uh, all of these things, um, and we allow you to to hook in and build this, uh, these sort of custom UIs in a very smart way. And this is part of the reason why. Um, the, the team behind the Hamilton app were very interested in the, in the stack here. Uh, the support for custom UI built in uh, and in a way that allowed them to target both Android and iOS with the same code base seems very attractive. It's not always that the app uh, have the same exact look and feel, but this notion that uh, iOS and Android can be, uh, the apps can be built by the same team um, is, a, is, a, is a, like a real time saver. One of the things we've seen at, the, at, at Google is that the effect of having two teams is, um, is, is not just double work. It's also very painful work of keeping these things uh, in sync. And, uh, and having feature parity between these things can be very important for a product, but it's very hard to deliver that uh, for the developers. So there's a lot of, uh, sort of friction that you remove by just having one thing. So I would claim that with Flutter, doing custom is, is easy, and as importantly, doing custom twice is not needed uh, in this case. So that's a, it's a major sort of selling point for the, for the stack here. One of the things, of course, that some people think when they, uh, when they see a solution uh, to, uh, to the cross-platform issue um, is that often um, solutions in this space come with a lot of compromises. Often it's very hard to get the right performance, and it's very hard to, um, to get the right sort of look and feel of your app. And we've had good experience with, um, with, um, with building apps um, and actually sort of cloning a, a previous version and uh, built, built with a native SDKs um, and sort of just upgrading uh, the app underneath uh, the feet of the users without telling them that they got a new version on a new tech stack without them being able to tell the difference. So that's a great sort of testament uh, that it's, it's very possible in Flutter to write high-performing uh, apps that look and feel exactly like something built with uh, the native SDKs. If you take a step like further into the, the stack here and look at the C++ part I showed you, um, one of the components there is the, the Dart component. Uh, and the Dart part of the, of the Flutter uh, system is the, is the one I'm, uh, I'm most familiar with. Uh, and it's the project I started uh, six or seven years ago, I don't remember. But it's a, it's a very sort of a, a long ongoing project and we are seeing a lot of success with it. Um, this is our logo. Um, Probably not super interesting, but uh, one of the most important things for us uh, is that uh, Dart is developed uh, at Google uh, by, uh, by my team there, and we've uh, we've uh, recently gotten a lot of success internally with uh, with uh, with the web part of our product, where you can develop web apps based on on Dart. And actually, um, Google's largest businesses, uh, AdSense, AdWords, the products that we make uh, the money uh, through, uh, are now all using using Dart. So it's um, it's a good way of us uh, sort of to, to keep supporting the development of that and, 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 and pushing it. Um, we see lots of growth. It's the fastest growing language inside of Google. And, and perhaps more importantly for me is the, is the notion that the teams that go to the stack here, they report a, uh, an increased productivity. This number is kind of weird. But this is the number that we get from them. They claim that, that going to the new stack here, all in all, gives them a, their developers a 2x productivity. 
This is not even uh, in a mobile setting where they get the one platform for free, uh, but just uh, the sort of the, the, the quality of the stack alone gives them a, a higher degree of productivity. In this context, uh, Dart is translated to JavaScript and runs in, in all the browsers. Um, and um, inside the company, mostly, we don't see it so much outside. Uh, the, uh, the version of Angular written in Dart is, is really taking off. We see lots of these big enterprise apps uh, being rewritten in, in Dart and with the Angular stack there. And they usually look a bit like this, like big apps, full screen apps um, for mobile. And they're all, these are all built in, uh, in, in Dart and Angular. Um, so there's this, of course, this notion that having the same uh, language to support both mobile and web is, is pretty attractive for, uh, for, for lots of reasons. So if you look at that, um, it's an unsurprising and object-oriented language. Some would say it's a little bit boring. Um, that's, that's almost flattering, I would say. It's, a, it's supposed to be familiar uh, to people who have a background in Java, C Sharp, JavaScript. Um, and that's also the feedback we get from, from people trying it out. How many of you are like Java developers? Quite a lot. Okay, and C Sharp is that easier as well? Yeah, JavaScript. That's oh, a good mix. Uh, I think this will be like, very easy for you guys to uh, to see when I go through a few examples. Class-based single inheritance, familiar syntax. The 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 latest addition I would say is that we've uh, we've upgraded the type system in Dart from being an optionally typed um, uh, language to now having a sound type system, and. Uh, we found that at scale, like when you hit like multi-million lines of code, um, that, that was the right trade-off for us to do in terms of supporting our developers better. But also, as we start compiling to, uh, to native, where the um, predictability, uh, performance uh, predictability, was really a, a key thing that the interaction should uh, be, it should be easy for developers who understand like, how the app uh, performs. Um, I'm not sure we're quite there yet, uh, but there's a, there's a major upgrade to the, to the language. Um, the way we usually uh, deal with Dart code is we have this sausage maker in the middle, our compiler, and we throw in Dart code. And, um, and then the other side, we get uh, either I APKs or, uh, or IPAs for, um, for iOS out, um, so with native code in there, or we get JavaScript code out that runs across the browsers. So a compiler like this is, is uh, sort of what I've been doing for the last many, many years. And it's a, it's a complicated sort of piece of machinery. Uh, but in some sense, this is all most people need to know about, right? You throw code in, and you get something out on the other side, almost exactly like a sausage maker. Um, it does give us a lot of benefits to have this approach, right? We can put in an optimization uh, phase in the middle of the compiler here that, that makes, the, makes the code that we emit small, uh, fast. Um, that's something that's really applicable both with JavaScript and, and uh, native code as the output. Um, and we can do a lot of the heavy lifting there to, uh, to be smart about what kind of code we produce. Um, and I think it's not the entire reason why people find that apps built in Flutter uh, perform well, but it's part of, the, uh, part of the reason. Clearly, the framework also has a huge uh, role to play in that, in that space. There is one problem with it, though. Um, it's super involved, this like, compile step, right? So you throw code in, and we, we, we chew on it. You have coffee, and uh, even just like showing you guys how to run Flutter on, on that emulate device just a few minutes ago, it took a while for that whole thing to spin up and, um, and like, get the code running on the device. And if you're used to like, Java and C Sharp, and uh, you're, you're probably familiar with this, like waiting around for the compiler to finish, uh, and it's a it really has a big impact on your productivity. And we find that people enjoy their work a lot less if they have to wait. And they also uh, develop workflows that are not necessarily super effective. Um, so we'd like to get a, a slightly simpler um, picture in, uh, in front of you than, than this thing. Maybe these guys are not very good at making sausages either. But it is quite involved, and it does take a long time. One of the attract uh, attractions, I think, of going to so JavaScript uh, in like React Native or uh, in, in uh, PhoneGap or Cordova is that there is no compile step for that. Right? That's all dealt with at runtime. Um, so we certainly also wanted to try to uh, provide the same benefits as you can with those things. And our solution is really, really simple. Uh, we just introduce just-in-time compilation, and you pay as you go. Uh, that has, has been built this way for a long time. Uh, but the combination of having 
both just-in-time compilation for development and ahead-of-time compilation for deployment is really a powerful thing. Uh, so that hybrid is, is, is really, really useful. You don't compile the application up front. You compile it as it executes, and you only pay for compiling the parts that are actually executed. Um, but in that, that sense, you, you, you just remove the, uh, the, uh, the overhead of the, of the compiler, or at least you move it to, to runtime where people tend to have a bit more patience for these things. I, I, let me show you how that actually works um, and give you like, a proper introduction to what coding in, in Flutter actually looks like. Let me see here. So, Flutter is um, comes with a, an IntelliJ plugin. Um, very soon, this plugin will also work on Android Studio. So, if you have that installed already, you don't have to install another version of IntelliJ. Um, IntelliJ is sort of a full, uh, fully fledged uh, uh, environment. Uh, some of you are probably familiar with it. Uh, I imagine most of you probably are. Uh, but Flutter has a plugin for it. Dart has a plugin for it, and you can write apps uh, in this in this context. Let me just fire up a, uh, an emulator here um, so we have something soon. That needs to boot the entire Android system, and that, that takes a while too, so it's one, another one of those things that you, you'd like to uh, not wait for that often. But let me walk you through the, uh, the code as it boots up. At the top, you have the, the main function. Uh, hopefully, that is not super surprising. That's where the uh, application starts. Uh, and in there, um, you just use the, uh, the Flutter framework to run your app. And an app is, is a widget. Everything's basically a widget here. There are two kinds of widgets. There are these uh, stateless widgets, um, and there are stateful widgets. The state and the widget are separated uh, because they have different uh, lifetimes. Um, and I'll, I'll be able to show you that in a moment. Um, but this is the reason why we have split it up this way. So, the way you actually construct UI in, uh, in Flutter is reacting to, uh, to a, a method call called build that tells you to take the current state and map it to the set of widgets that should represent that state visually. So you have here a, um, a build method that returns a new material app that has a, a home page in it. Um, so it's all widgets all the way down. If you go into the home page, that is the stateful widget. So it's not super interesting on its own, but the home page state is a little bit more interesting. Um, the home page state has a more complicated build method down here that returns a scaffold with an app bar and some body and some centering. This looks almost like something you, you could also have written in like, say, HTML. Um, but here you construct it all in Dart code. Uh, that means that you can use a debugger in it. You can, you can have local variables. You can refactor it using the common tools that you use for the language. So, Abstractions like classes and whatever can be used to actually abstract over these, uh, these things and the construction of these things. Let me try to run it on the device here. See if that works. Um, I promised you it would be fast, but it really isn't fast uh, with the first run here. We still have to build the version of the app and get it uh, moved over there. Uh, but once, once we're done with that, um, we actually have an app on the other side in the emulator that we can start interacting with. So the app is pretty simple. Um, there is a count in the middle, it's very small, and a button in the, uh, at the, uh, in the corner here, I can press it. And what happens inside the app is actually there's the unpressed event that calls increment counter up here. Uh, an increment counter is implemented at the top. It updates the counter, and it tells the system that the state has changed. Then the framework will say, OK, the state has changed. Let me call the build method again get new UI elements back from there, and the widgets, and then look at what, what kind of difference there was from the previous widget tree to the new one, and only update those elements. Where it becomes really nice is that, um, say we wanted to change the, uh, the font size of that, that count, we can just go in here and say, style new text style, let's see, something like this, and we can say, I'd like to see this change done on the device right away. And then we actually preserve the state, so count is still five, but we've updated the, uh, the code over there that, that tells the system how we map from state to UI, so the UI changes. And of course, we can change anything we want to in here. We could say that the, the icon is not the one we want. We want something else here. Let's see. Uh, access time. That's probably a silly one to choose. But I can just reload that thing. You get the new icon down in the corner and you can continue working. So you can iterate on your design, change the code, update things as you go. 
you can see that the hot reload, as we called it, uh, is an action here. So it means that we, we do a, a state-preserving update of the code and the UI. And in this case, we do it in 558 milliseconds, which is sort of the goal for us is a sub-second, so it doesn't get in the way. This is a really powerful way of actually manipulating, building uh, apps. And it works on both Android and iOS. Um, and it's a, I think it's, a, sort of, it's about time we had a framework that supported this really well. Um, there's lots of things uh, you can, you can uh, experiment with in this, uh, in this context. And there are lots of different uh, design um, things. But the, the core of it is really pretty much what you see here. You construct your UI from the state. You manipulate the code as you want to see how that behaves. Um, you have the option to start over if you really want to, if you do want to clear the state. Um, but you don't have to in most cases. One of the things that, uh, that I've found uh, working on native apps um, and found really painful is, is often the interaction that you, you're debugging or working on improving is fairly deep into the, into, into the product. And it can be hard to navigate to the right place with the right state and, and try to manipulate it and see how it updates. With this, you don't have to do that. And uh, that's a really powerful thing. If you look at the, uh, the, the counter example here, uh, it is not just the, it's not just the UI elements we can change. We can also change the, uh, the logic of the app. So if we wanted to, uh, we could go ahead and say, let's update uh, the counter a little bit more whenever we do this. Uh, this shouldn't change the UI, but the code over there is now updated and behaves differently than before. Probably a little bit silly, but now it actually adds, uh, adds two every time you want to do anything here. One of the things that I think work, uh, work really well here is that uh, you can also uh, set breakpoints in the code and, and work through it uh, this way. Um, and it works really nicely with, uh, with that whole sort of integration thing. Another thing that is also um, important to mention is that having everything in, in code here means that you can use the same tools uh, for profiling uh, and finding uh, bottlenecks in your app uh, across everything you do here. You don't have to uh, be an expert on CSS and how animations work with that. Uh, it's all sort of governed by one system. Let's go back here. So people that start using Flutter actually pick up on this. Uh, the, the way you develop, the way you interact with the system is very pleasant, and it gives a big sort of productivity boost. Um, we find that people that, um, that, that start, uh, start using Flutter here have a very hard time going back to a sort of more classical uh, tool chains where they have to wait for longer. So, Let's, let's go back to Hamilton and just like, see if, if these things here uh, actually end up uh, making sense for them. So Hamilton uh, ended up with one code base and two great apps uh, on Android and iOS after about three months. Um, they were very happy with the app. It's, it's, uh, it's, um, it's downloaded a, a lot in the US, not so much here for obvious reasons. Um, and people really interact with it. And the custom UIs that they built in that context, they really worked for them. The, uh, it's available in, in, in both app stores, uh, so it's sort of a, an official app launched here. Um, we also have apps built at Google um, that are not sort of publicly available because it's our internal tools that we're building with this thing. Uh, but we're working on sort of the next level of, of uh, Google apps based on, on Flutter as well. So Flutter makes it easy to build um, beautiful mobile apps um, and fast too. I mean, it's a, it's a new SDK. Uh, so there is a learning curve, uh, but the language and the framework is not, in many ways, uh, they're, they're not that uh, new in the sense that Dart is a very familiar language, and the reactive paradigm is certainly happening out there with the success of React uh, uh, and React Native. It is available as an open source um, alpha release right now. Um, the quality of it is really... Um, it's not the reason why we call it alpha. We, f we know that there are a couple of um, areas, dimensions, uh, that we haven't uh, completed yet that, that, that real uh, projects tend to need. And these are uh, things like localization, accessibility, um, having support built in so that screen readers work uh, correctly with apps built in, in Flutter. It's a really important thing. If you want to take a look at it, you can go to uh, flutter.io. Uh, that's the website for it. And there you can download it and then try it out. It works across Linux, Mac, Windows, and supports building apps for, for Android and, and iOS. 
that's it. But we have time for questions, so I'm kind of hoping that we can get some, uh, some good ones. Uh, and I think we have a microphone as well, and maybe some questions. Just <laughs> questions from the app. Um, so I'll start with one. How do you access platform-specific APIs like Bluetooth, et cetera? So the, um, the way we access the, uh, the capabilities of the underlying platforms is um, based on a, a messaging approach where you, you implement the native code uh, in Java, or Kotlin, Swift, or Objective-C, and then you expose that through a messaging API to the dot layers on, on top. And that means that if there's a service or a, a platform um, capability that you need to access that nobody has, has written this kind of interface for, um, there is some work to be done there. There is a, um, a, a collection of, of packages out there that start sort of plugging that part of the hole. So there you can find uh, access for uh, GPS and battery levels and all those things. So that's sort of a growing part of the ecosystem. Um, so the real answer is you write the native code, um, and then through that native code, you ex expose a message-based uh, API to the dot side. How stable is Flutter at the moment? Are breaking changes likely to happen often? Um, so Flutter is quite stable and has been uh, stable for, uh, for a while. Uh, that was very important as we started getting customers on, on board the stack uh, that they had a, 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 a solid foundation. Um, it doesn't mean that we will never do uh, breaking changes, uh, but we know that these things have to be dealt with, announced, and taken care of in a good way. Uh, and we've seen a few API changes that were actually breaking over the last uh, half year. Uh, but uh, all in all, I think that process has gone pretty smoothly. So I would say fairly stable with very few hard guarantees on not breaking things. We do learn from, uh, from uh, getting new customers on board. And sometimes we find that uh, we can improve the APIs and make them easier to discover and easier to use correctly. And we tend to do that. Um, what exactly do you mean by compiles to native? So, um, so the way we compile the native code is that we, um, we've written a compiler from, uh, from Dart code that actually translates to essentially uh, uh, shared library uh, objects. Uh, so basically we produce uh, a machine code that uh, compiles to, to not to native Java code, but to native machine code. So these are ARM instructions, uh, ARM64, ARM32. Um, and we control that, that whole sort of pipeline and generate efficient code for running uh, the applications. An interesting part was actually that early in the project, we had uh, a bigger blue base layer, more code in C++. Uh, so more of the layout algorithms were in C++. Um, and we found that actually moving them to the, to the Dart side uh, improved the performance, mostly because you didn't have to cross the, the boundary between C++ and Dart as often. So just like getting things together, exposing them as more user code, and getting the compiler to see all of that actually sped up the code quite significantly. So compiling to native code is straight to like ARM code. What is the migration story for converting an existing application to Flutter? Um, so the migration story, that's really a good question. Um, Flutter is technically uh, just a view, and you've seen it uh, run in full screen here. Uh, so there's, it's, it's very conceivable to take that Flutter view and embed it into some, some other other app. We see people doing this where the Flutter part of their app is, is um, introduced and, uh, and extended on a sort of page per page basis. Uh, where it gets more tricky is if you want to embed uh, sort of native controls directly into your, uh, your Flutter app. Um, Flutter uh, sort of controls and paints all the pixels on the screen. So that sort of merging those two things is very hard. Um, so we find that people get more success if they can do it at like, a fairly coarse grained level at the, basically at the screen level. Uh, so most people that start with Flutter probably find some simple part of their app and try it out there. Uh, we've seen people have lots of success with like settings page and things that feel like uh, they're sort of off the side anyway. Uh, but I think that's this, um, it's sort of touched on a very important thing that um, most of the, uh, the apps that we've seen uh, ship on this so far have been like all written in, in, in Flutter. Um, and that, that sort of integration story is something we'll be looking at, like how we can improve going forward. Okay, there's a number of questions on this. Does Flutter require you to develop using Dart, or can you use other languages as well? Um, so I think the short answer is Flutter uh, 
pretty much requires you to use Dart um, in the sense that all the APIs, the entire framework is exposed as a set of Dart APIs. So I think it would be very hard to do anything about that. In theory, you can do anything you, you put your mind to. But I think uh, the, the, the tooling and the framework really uh, uh, promotes the, uh, writing Dart code here. It's very, very easy to integrate uh, Java, Kotlin, or uh, Swift or Objective-C code in, in a project like this. And we, we do this all the time to expose native functionality or platform capabilities. Um, but usually, these things are, are put in there for things that are not driving the UI. So if you have like logic or computation or things like that that you would like to keep in Kotlin or Java, you can certainly do that. I think once you start wanting that to actually have an impact on the UI in, in, a, in a complex way, that's going to be much harder. Okay. We'll do one more. I think there's a lot of questions, so maybe you can stay around after. And I will stay can, around, uh, yes, definitely. Can come up. Any drawbacks? Why shouldn't, we, why shouldn't we use Flutter or Dart? Why shouldn't you use Flutter or Dart? Um, I, I think, in some sense, we already touched on that. Like if you have a, a, a desire to do a sort of very sort of integrated uh, uh, system where you have like lots of um, Swift code uh, around that touches and builds a UI, um, then this is going to be hard to, to use in that context. Also, if you're relying on custom controls uh, written in those languages uh, that, that need to be there to, to uh, build your UI from, that's also going to be hard to do, do right. So I think those are the areas where you have less fun with, uh, with Flutter than, than, than you're supposed to. All right. Um, again, so, uh, yeah, Casper will stand and wait and will, take I all will, the uh, questions yes, that you definitely. may have. Yeah. Oh. And, uh, oh, was there someone who had a hand? I might as well just uh, let it around. <laughs> yeah. Hi, very nice talk. Thanks. Uh, I'm Lars. Uh, I am wondering how do you see in the near and far future uh, Flutter uh, coexist with uh, PWAs? Because it, it seems that there's a lot of uh, overlap, but where, for example, in the Hamilton, Hamilton app, yeah. Uh, what features did they need that would not be possible in a PWA, assuming that Apple had their thing going at the time, <laughs> which they didn't? Um, <laughs> I think there's a, there, there's, a, uh, there's a big overlap here between these technologies, and I think we'll find, um, find things that, that are, are better on, um, on one or the other side, depending on what, you're, what you need to build here. It is true that the iOS bit uh, used to be a real issue for, uh, for a PWA, uh, Progressive web apps, um, and hopefully that's going to be a solved issue in the not too distant future. Um, in some ways, what I like about Flutter over something like PWAs is that um, the web uh, is a fairly complex uh, like piece of machinery. It can do a lot of things and do it does a lot of things really, really well. But it also comes with a, a ton of um, sort of legacy features, things that it has to support because it's always been done that way. And when you're building a new mobile app on top of a foundation that's so complex, uh, there are interesting trade-offs involved also at the performance front. Uh, something like Flutter and, and Dart is much more sort of tuned for, for that setup. Uh, we've just cut away the things that we didn't need to build mobile apps. Um, so there are definitely things that we don't have to carry around. Um, and this is where I see the, uh, the biggest dif sort of difference between those two stacks, right? Uh, there's something really nice about PWAs, and you can just build on top of what was already there, uh, and there's a lot of power from that. But I think when you look at the, the trade-offs on performance and then those things, this is an area where I think we'll see, see more differences become visible as we, as we continue um, with this sort of development of, of Flutter. Does that sort of answer your question? It's a very hard thing, right? Uh, also religious. <laughs> also religious, yes. Best questions are, yeah. Does anyone have... Any burning questions or would like to come up? Well, thank you. All right. Otherwise, yes, please remember to vote as well. And thanks. <laughs>